who are here today. Uh, my name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor here for Bridgepoint. And as we get started, let's pray together to ask God to have his way with us now. Father God, we love you. Uh, you are the only king. You reign forever. And so we gather here to make sure that we acknowledge you as our king, that we surrender our lives to you. And so we pray that in this moment together we would worship you, that you would be lifted high above everything else. And we pray that you would speak your truth to us, God. I pray that your wisdom would inhabit my words, that your grace would pour out, and that you would speak what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So today is the finale of the first teaching series of the year. We've called it Sunday Reset. And during our times together in January, we have been talking about the value that we want to place on gathering weekly together. We come together every Sunday, and that's been the practice of Christians really throughout history. Since Jesus rose from the grave, On that first Sunday morning, the Christian said, we've got to meet together to celebrate what this means for us. And so week after week, even when Sundays weren't days off, they would gather together before their workday started to make sure that it had this place of priority in their life. And so years later, we look back on what defined the time together for those first Christians. It's actually practices that we still pull into our our times every week together. And we are looking at these to understand what value and priority these should have in our lives. Because they bring us back to what we need to make central. They bring us back to God's grace and His wisdom and His purpose and His glory. And so today, uh, we are turning one last time to Acts chapter 2. This has been the guiding verse for the entire series The book of Acts tells the story of the beginning of the church, and at the very beginning of that book, we catch this glimpse in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, of the practices that the first Christians devoted themselves to. All right, so I've been challenging you to memorize this, and so as it flashes up on the screen in a moment, I will read from it. I invite you to read with me, and if you haven't memorized, you just close your eyes and say it from memory, all right? So let's let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, here it is. Read with me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Here we are introduced to four practices that defined the time the first Christians shared with each other. And as we look at these, we see that we still practice these every time we are together. And so the first week we talked about the apostles' teaching, and for us that is teaching from God's Word, Scripture, and how that teaching can reset God's wisdom to its rightful place in our lives, that God's wisdom is what guides us to the best life possible. The second week, we looked at what they called the breaking of bread. We call it the Lord's Supper or communion. And we understood that this weekly practice of remembering the body and blood of Jesus, the death and resurrection, resets us to God's grace, that it is by God's grace we've been saved. It's by God's grace we live, and we need that reset week after week. Then last week, We talked about singing as our collective expression of prayer to God every week and how singing helps us to say more than just words. And it puts God in his rightful place and it puts us in ours and therefore it resets us to God's glory in our life. And finally today, we talk about the word from this passage, fellowship. Now, it is a very churchy word, isn't it? And so it it needs some explanation. I think I grew up with a misunderstanding of fellowship. See, in the church I grew up in, we had the auditorium. It was, it was a round room where we would sing, where we'd learn. They had a wing for classes, for what we called Sunday school. They had a wing for offices. And then off the back of the building was this big square room with fluorescent lighting and a whole bunch of tables. And it's where we would go after the service to eat donuts. I ate a lot of them. And the adults would get coffee and the kids would get milk or juice. And that room was called the fellowship hall. And so other times, Several times throughout the year, people would gather there. We would have potlucks where people would bring their casseroles or things covered in cheese and gravy, and we would eat them, right? And so I assumed that if that's what happened in the fellowship hall, then fellowship must be eating and talking, but mostly eating, right? And for a chubby kid like me, that was fantastic. So I loved fellowship. But as I grew, I've come to understand that fellowship means so much more than that, although that might be included in it. We shouldn't just dismiss that, right? Because those times are fun. That's not all that fellowship means. This word that comes out as fellowship in our English Bibles was originally the Greek word koinonia. And that word koinonia 
meant to have in common, to share, or to have the same root. So imagine a plant that pops up above ground and flowers throughout a yard, but it's all tied together by the same root system. That's kind of the picture or the image of this koinonia, this fellowship that the early Christians were devoted to. So it was an intricate part, an integral part of their identity. But it wasn't just who they were. They lived it out. They were one in every sense of it. And so we catch this beautiful glimpse of the first Christians sharing what they had with others in need and living, like basically sharing life together, being devoted to one another. And so today, as we understand fellowship and our commitment to it, how we practice that and how it influences our lives, we're going to essentially ask three questions. The first is, where does this oneness or this unity come from? What is our part in it? And then finally, what does this have to do with Sundays? All right. And so as we ask that first question, where does our oneness, where does our unity come from? I want to begin with the most basic understanding that the church is a community held together by what we believe about Jesus. Let me say that again. The church is a community held together by what we believe about Jesus. So it is our belief in Jesus that pulls us together. There is no fellowship without something to share. There is no oneness without some, some central part of our identity, right? And so that central part of our identity, the aspect or object of our oneness is what we believe about Jesus, which is often called the gospel. That word simply means the good news of Jesus. And it's captured, described in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. So the one body means the church. We are one together. There is one Holy Spirit. So when we are saved by Jesus and he cleans us up, the Holy Spirit, the same spirit, lives in each of us. And there is one hope to which we were called, meaning that we all gaze longingly at the same promise of God that someday sin will not define our existence, but we will be set free from it and we will live forever with him. So we have one body. We are one spirit. We, are, we have one hope. And we keep going. It says there is one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. Then it continues in verse 6, it says, and one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. If you read that, you notice that there is a word that keeps coming up. That word is one. That we share one God. We share one Savior. We share one faith in Jesus. We share one hope. We share one promise. We are one church. We share one Holy Spirit who fills us all. And that is what we believe. And it is wrapped around Jesus. Without Him, we have none of that. And so it is our belief in Jesus that holds us together. It pulls us together. It acts like this gravitational force upon us, right? I mean, that's what gravity is. It's this... So, when an object has enough mass, it has a way of pulling its other things toward it, right? That's why we are held on earth, because gravity. And so the larger the object, the greater the force of its attraction, the, greater, the, the stronger the pull it has on the bodies or the objects within its field. And so that gravity becomes a greater force than any other force applied to those objects. So that's why the moon doesn't shoot off into space, why people don't fly up into the air, is because earth is large enough to have a gravity to pull things to itself. And that is what we believe about Jesus. The gospel has a gravity that holds us all together. What we share about Jesus can pull people who in every other way are different from one another together. And the gravity of the gospel is stronger, it's more powerful than any other force that might be applied to us. It is stronger than any political opinions we might have, any stances on social issues. It is stronger than any lines of, of race or ethnicity that might divide us. It is stronger than any, um, any ways that we might be divided based on um, financial picture or profession or education or where we live, or with whom we live. It is stronger than all of those. So whatever forces might be applied to us to pull us apart and divide us, the gospel is bigger. And the force that comes from that, that pulls us together, triumphs. And so we are one 
And the reason we are one is because of what we believe about Jesus. And this oneness was so important to the first Christians that they devoted themselves to living it out. See, they lived in a world that was hostile to Christianity. It was not uncommon for people to be arrested for what they believed about Jesus, for them to be pulled out of their home, even at times for them to be beaten, mistreated, ostracized, or killed for what they believed about Jesus. And so in a world like that, you can start to understand why they valued so much what they shared in common with others who believed in Jesus. God knew that their oneness was essential to their survival. And so, when Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, he prayed a prayer for those who would eventually believe in him. And the object of his prayer, the end to his prayer, was that we might be one just as he and the Father are one. Because he knew that we needed each other to survive. It's kind of like planet Earth gives this, uh, this great glimpse of the life of emperor penguins. Maybe you've seen this segment. Maybe you've seen it someplace else. Emperor pigmen, penguins are amazing to me because they, uh, they live in one of the harshest climates in the world. They live in Antarctica, the bottom of the world, right? And they endure what ends up being the darkest, harshest, coldest winters in the world. And so their life cycle goes like this, all right? All the penguins go during the spring or the summer. They mate. They give birth to eggs. And then the, the male penguins take it upon their pouch or within their pouch, and then they incubate the eggs. They can't move very far. They just stay there while the females go off to hunt and bring back food. So while the females are away, usually during the winter, the men are stuck there with up to 100 mile per hour wind, uh, wind temperatures that plummet all the way to 60 below zero, snowstorms, blizzards. It is miserable, but they've found a way to survive, to preserve each other and to protect the future generations. And the way they do it is to act as one. They cluster together, they huddle together because they know that the only way for them to survive is by them acting like one. And so they take turns being in the inner circles. They take turns being on the outside where it's the harshest, where it's the coldest. And so together they survive. They protect each other and they prepare for future generations. And that is the purpose of the unity of the church, that we might help each other survive in a hostile climate, and that we might prepare for future generations of believers to place faith in Jesus and be saved by him. We need each other to do that. And so in the New Testament, there's this beautiful picture of their unity, their oneness. There are over 50 passages that contain the phrase one another, that give instruction on how the church is to live out this unity, this oneness, this fellowship. I want to read a couple examples to you. From Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we read, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Again, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we read, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ Jesus, Christ God, forgave you. So here already we have be devoted to one another, honor one another, be kind and compassionate, forgive one another. And we can just go, keep going down the list of these 50-some verses that give instructions about how to live out our oneness. And we are instructed to serve one another, to bear with one another, to encourage one another, to kiss one another. That's in there. But before we practice that, we should probably find out the context and the meaning, all right? So when I was in high school, I used to go to youth retreats. We, we would uh, walk around, and my friends would do this. I would never do this. But they would go up to a girl they thought was cute, and they'd say, do you, do you believe in the Bible? And the girl would, of course, because you're at a church camp or whatever, say, yes, of course I do. Do you want to do what the Bible says to honor God? Yes, of course. And then they would say, can I read you a passage? And they would say, greet each other with a holy kiss. And they'd say, would you like to honor the Bible with me? It's a terrible pickup line. It never worked for them. But the point is that we are given these instructions on how to live out our oneness in Jesus. And in doing these, by bearing with one another, by forgiving one another, by serving and submitting to one another, and encouraging and being patient with one another, and kind and compassionate, you start to get the sense that this oneness, this community, this fellowship is really beautiful, isn't it? 
It creates this desirable community that all of us would say, man, if there are people like that, I want to be a part of it. And that's exactly what God intended for his people, the church. And so even if you are brand new with us, even if you don't really know what to make of Jesus today, my hope is that this glimpse of what the church is supposed to be might stir in you this desire, this dream of what you might become a part of. That God intends for his church to be this beautiful community that is held together by what they believe in Jesus and by holding together to that, they give life to one another and they flourish together. So the second question I said we would ask is what is our part in this? And so for that, we are going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read several verses from it, so the page number will appear up on the screen. If you'd like to follow along, you can grab a Bible from a chair around you. You can flip there. 1 Corinthians is a book that was written to a church with a lot of problems. They they were getting a lot of stuff wrong. It was just a couple decades after um, the church was started. There was just a mess there. There was conflict, division. And so their pastor, church planter, a man named Paul, wrote to them to straighten some things out. And one of the things he wanted them to understand was the unity, the oneness they were to share within the church. And so near the end of this letter, which we call 1 Corinthians, he wrote this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. He says, just as a body, think physical body, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with the church. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. Those were the social topics of the day that divided people, whether or not you were a Jew, whether you were slave or free. So he goes, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, he goes, we are one body, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And so even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. His point is this. He's talking about the church. He says, you want to understand how to function as God's people, how to live out your oneness, your fellowship. You need to understand that we may be a bunch of different parts, but we all form one body. This is a beautiful picture of who we are because we all are very different. We have unique things about us. We have different mindsets, different gifts, different talents. And so at first glance, you might think that our diversity makes us different is a reason for us to divide. But it's quite the opposite. Just like a body has many parts and each part has a unique function that serves the overall health of the body, the church has different parts and each one is intended to serve the overall health, growth, and maturity of the body of which you are a part. It was all by God's design. We are told just a little earlier in 2 Corinthians 12, There are different kinds of gifts. This is verse 4. Different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So this makes it clear that our unity unity comes out of diversity that was designed by God. And the verse that follows explains why. It says, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the what? Say it with me. For the common good. So it's not for your good or for my good that I alone may benefit, but in the same way that all the parts of the body work together so that the body at large is healthy, the parts of the body were designed by God. The parts of the church, the people in the church were gifted by God, prepared by God to serve, to work, to be interdependent for the common good of the church. And so what we see from this is that we need each other to flourish in our faith. I need you. You need me. We need each other to flourish in our faith. We are interdependent. That's the beauty of this image, that we need each other, that we grow best when each of us are doing our part to serve and to strengthen the church. And so there are some who will readily accept that and they'll go, absolutely. I need the church. The church needs me. It's this beautiful cooperation that produces life in all of us. But there are others who might at first want to object to this. And I think the two most common objections to this suggestion that we need each other to flourish is the first one is that nobody needs me. 
And it's said with this spirit of self-deprecation where you go, I don't know enough. I don't have anything the church offers. It seems like the church has all their spots filled. Like no one needs me. I don't have anything to contribute. And to that, we read in verse 15, Now if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body, right? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. That's talking about you. God designed you. He gifted you. He placed you in the church exactly how he wants you to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but they form one body. And so to those who might convince themselves that no one needs them in the church, we are told that every part has a place. Every person has a perspective, has insight, has a gift or talent or ability that will somehow lift up and strengthen others within the church. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know everything about God. You don't have to have the most impressive talent or gift. All you have to do is show up to be here, to serve, to encourage, to speak truth, to, to pray for one another. And all of a sudden, you become a part of the body that improves the overall health of the church. The second opposition that some may have is not, I, no one needs me, but you can guess the inverse, I don't need anyone. This may come with a spirit of pride that says no one else has anything that I need. It may come because you look at yourself as mature, as knowledgeable, as gifted. Maybe you might say that, I don't need anyone, because you've been burned by the church and you're not ready to open yourself up to the risk of letting people into your life again. But one way or another, people say, I don't need anyone. And to that, we read in verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Because we know that no matter how essential, how important, how impressive any single part of the body is, it cannot survive on its own. And the same is true for us. It doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you've got figured out, or how bad your past experiences have been. You cannot survive on your own any more than a hand can without the rest of the body. We need each other. Every one of us needs something that the life, the body can provide for us. Whether it's service and ministry to our kids. Or, or someone who is singing to lead us into worship that we could never foster on our own. Or the help, the encouragement, the prayer that comes from just being present with each other in the lobby. Or in home groups. Or in ministry teams. Or in friendship. We need each other. We depend on each other. It is essential for our life of faith. And so you might say, what does this have to do with Sunday mornings? Because that's what we're talking about in Sunday Reset, right? Is the importance of what we do here. Well, if we go back to that initial passage, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where it says that the, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and so on, that word fellowship was referring not just to their identity that they embraced, but to their identity that they expressed. That they would express that identity within their weekly rhythm. And so it was they're somehow a part of what they did with each other every Sunday. So my guess is that for them, fellowship wasn't pausing in their service to turn around and shake someone's hand or saying hi to someone when the person up front instructs you to or about going back to the lobby to grab a donut and coffee and chat it up. But their fellowship was actually, none of those are wrong, by the way. I just don't think that it was the sum total of what they intended by fellowship. Their fellowship was actually expressed not in part of the worship service or in their Sunday gathering, but in the expression of their worship service. They actually gathered because they were one. It became the visible, tangible expression of them being a community held together by what they believed about Jesus. And so, we see, after years in the first generation, second generation, maybe even third generation of believers in the first century, that eventually, over time, their view and value of the Sunday gathering started to diminish. And I'm guessing their reasons might be better than ours. It was because people were threatening to kill them if they gathered together. 
We're threatening to arrest them if they held church that week. We're willing to arrest the pastors and leaders and take them away. And so people slowly started to wonder if it was really all that important to gather together. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we read this charge to those Christians. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This writer is pleading with the Christians of the first century, don't give up on each other. Don't stop meeting together. Don't you get that you need each other? People are waiting on you to show up so they might be encouraged by you and strengthened by you so that you can have what you need to make it through another week of following Jesus. Don't stop meeting. Don't stop gathering. Don't give up. And I believe that we need the same reminder that when we gather together, it is for the sake of living out our oneness with each other. This isn't the full expression of our fellowship. Fellowship pours over into our lives, into our weeks. But it often begins and is best expressed here on Sunday morning, where what we believe about Jesus draws us from every corner of our world, every part of our community. And so what begins here then spreads into other parts of our lives where we get to experience more of this oneness through small groups or through ministry teams that serve together for a purpose or through friendship that starts to shape us and produce fruit in us. But oftentimes it begins here. And so gathering together prioritizes our commitment to each other. I believe that's at least part of the purpose here. That gathering together prioritizes our commitment. Our lives are chaotic. We tend to drift from each other, right? We tend to live in isolation if we don't do something intentional about it. And so Sunday gatherings are the way that we say, these people matter to me. I need to go because I need what they can offer in my life and faith. And I need to go because I believe I have something to offer for them. And then together we will be built up. Be strengthened and stable and secure in our faith. We need each other. And so the aim of this entire series, as we've walked through the different things we do and the way that we express it, the aim of this entire series has been to elevate the value you place on Sunday gatherings and to challenge you to be more committed to it. For some of you, I recognize that you come as often as you possibly can. And so I hope that this series has emboldened you in that and encouraged you and maybe given you words to articulate the reason you do that to your children so that they might gain that value from you. But for others of you, you need that value to be buoyed. You need your commitment to be elevated. And so my question to you is, what would it take in your life to increase your commitment to being consistent here, to engaging so that you might have that weekly reset that gives God's wisdom and God's grace and God's glory in His people their rightful place in your life. What would it take? Would you need to reschedule some things? Would you need to handle Saturday nights a little differently so you can get up in the morning? Do you need to change what you sign your kids up for on Sundays? Do you need to stop making excuses? If this has value in your life, to put God in His rightful place and to remind you of just how much we need each other, then it might take some intentionality to give it the place it deserves. But I'm telling you that you can look at the lives of the people who've prioritized this, the people who give God His rightful place. You can see that it's not a guarantee, but it often results in God's fruit in their lives in good and beautiful ways. And that is what we want for you. And so would you prayerfully consider what it would take for you to increase the value you give to this and increase the commitment you make to it. God wants our faith to endure. He wants us to flourish. And he has provided for us in the church what we need most for that to happen. Each other. And let me pray. God Almighty, we love you. I thank you for your grace and your purpose in our lives. I pray for these people, your church, whom I love and serve, that you would please draw us together week after week, not because of what we might individually get out of it, but because of the way that we build up together the body of Jesus, his church on earth. God, use us for your purpose. 
Bind us together in love. In Jesus' name.